So I'm Tim Perfit from Two Canoe Software. This is not a vendor session. This is a session on enterprise bootcamp deployment. We Two Canoe Software does make WinClone, which a lot of people like for deploying. Um, but really, what we're we'll focusing on is how to prepare this win uh, win the Windows image for deployment. How many people use Dual Boot Max? Hopefully, everybody and you're in the right place. How many people that want to use dual, dual Boot Max but aren't? Okay, there we go. We'll see. By the time you get out here, we'll, you'll have a, hopefully a better understanding of what's the road ahead. Um, just personally, this is an exciting session for me because we um, one request that I've been trying to work on for like the last at least four years is getting WinPE and integration with the Microsoft infrastructure in a way that uh, can work with a lot of different customers and work consistently. And I think we've got that. And so it's been a long road to get to this place. So I'm excited about being able to talk about this because every uh, in the past it's been very incremental updates and this is kind of a leap forward in terms of kind of what you're able to do. So it opens up a lot of different ways to it. Oh, is that what the problem is? My ears are the wrong shape? Is that? All right. Hello, is that better? Bend it, okay, is that better? Do you hear me? Hello, check, check. Okay, we'll try this. Um, so yeah, so I'm very excited about it. We'll talk about that, but there's a lot of different ways to deploy win Windows images or deploy bootcamp into your environments. Um, and so we'll talk about a lot of the different pieces. Specifically, um, you can't really understand how to deploy Windows unless you understand how Windows boots. And Windows boot, I always love to see the progression of somebody that's used to working on a PC and they come to a dual boot Mac and they assume it's gonna boot the exact same way. Because things look similar enough but it definitely has its own quirks to it and you can't use the same techniques, um, you use similar ones. And so understanding how Windows boots on a Mac is really important. It's also important to know the, really the only, well, let me say, when you escalate any issues with Bootcamp, anyone that does dual boot will know they escalate issues to Apple, they'll say the only supported way to install Windows on your Mac is through Bootcamp Assistant. This is the tier one support, they'll tell you. Um, so understanding what Bootcamp Assistant does and making sure you do stuff similar to that is important because that's really the way that Apple engineers it to work, right? This is, this is somebody that buys a Mac from the retail store and wants to install Windows on it. And that is a fully supported way and we do, we want to do things exactly that, that same way without double clicking through the UI, right? Because who wants to install Windows manually on 5,000 machines? Not me. Um, and then the important thing is customizing Windows deployment. So we have three different ways we can, we're going to talk about to be able to do that. Um, and one of the, the new thing we're going to talk about is deploying with WinPE. How many people use WinPE or have Microsoft infrastructures? You want to do that? Okay, good number. And then some troubleshooting. And that's going to be combined with some questions and answers because um, that's, I really want to have that interactive because uh, the issues we're seeing are not necessarily the issues that you guys are seeing. So f let's jump right in. The... Um, Let's talk about how the Mac boots. So there's four different kind of ways that the Mac can boot up, and so, uh, or the way Windows can boot up. The first one is master boot record. I actually don't even know if, if Bootcamp can boot that way. I haven't tried it in a long time. It used to be able to do that. If you had a straight kind of PC master boot record disk, it would boot on it. That was kind of the way that legacy PCs would do it before they switched over to EFI. Since Intel Macs came out, EFI has been the standard of the way the Mac boots um, in kind of a variant of that. And Windows, as of Windows 8, on the client boots with EFI. And then we have legacy machines, which is generally 2013 and earlier. There are exceptions depending on when Apple released stuff. And then we have the new iMac Pro. And today announced was the new MacBook Pro, which uh, I don't know if rumor has it, but it has, shows it has the T2, which is most likely going to use secure boot as well. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that as well. Um, when the iMac Pro first came out, I got my hands on one, and I kind of saw... Um, so there's a lot of rumors around like the iMac Pro wasn't going to have boot camp or it wouldn't be able to boot boot camp uh, or it's going to be fully supported. So when I got it, I didn't know what to expect, right, in terms of Windows. And what I found surprised me and delighted me. I was surprised and delighted. So let's go through the different scenarios. So it's kind of, this is about, imagine back that you're, I don't know when the first PCs came out, 79, 82, what was the first, when, the mic, uh, when did the IBM PC first come out? Who owned an IBM PC when it first came out? What year? Looks like, let's say 81 or 82. 81 or 82, okay. Most likely it booted this way with the master boot record. You get four partitions. That was enough until they ex discovered extended partitions. But this is really kind of up until Windows 8, 
This is what, my, what, what Windows wanted to see to be able to boot, right? So it had, um, this is the first boot sector on your disk, and all disks have this. Um, and it has the bootstrap code, which is f uh, a little snippet of code, and then you have 443 bytes to do your partition table, and you have four partitions. And um, so that's master boot record will start executing codes here, and then that's kind of what it expects. So the key components in that is the boot sector has to be there. Right? If there's no code, then it won't boot up. Um, there's a flag, a partition type, and a volume boot record. So how many times have you turned on a PC or a Mac and have just a black screen come up? Right? Nothing. Anybody seen that before? Absolutely nothing. Sometimes you get the little white line up top saying, please insert a floppy diskette. Right? That's actually good in terms of it's not a black screen, right? You got further. You kind of know what it is. And then sometimes you get a blue screen. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So what, what happens when you turn on a PC or an older PC? You get post, power on self-test. So it, the screen flickers. And then it goes and it looks for the master boot record and it starts executing that code. And it looks and references the, parti the partition and see, does it have a flag on it? So those one, two, three, four, does it have a flag? If it does, then it passes control off to the volume boot record, which then st starts booting Windows up, right? That, then it's aware of it. So if you look at where it can fail, it can fail in a lot of different places, right? If you don't have a flag partition, you don't have uh, a volume boot record, you don't have a master bo uh, bootstrap code, all those things on a Mac or on a PC when the disk's first format aren't there, right? So if you get a completely black screen, most likely there's no bootstrap code. If you get the insert diskette, it means there's no volume boot record or the partition isn't flagged. So it's kind of, it does a lot of these little pieces that need to be in place. So let's actually look at it because that would be awesome. So I have a GPD, a GPT disk on my Mac, so I'm gonna get my little thumb drive, which I formatted as master boot record last night. Where did I put it? One second. I lost my key, I have my tile app. Let me make sure I do that. All right, give me one second, let me do my tile app. I love tile. It'll probably start ringing down in our booth. That'd be great. Oh, no, that's my little hub. I want to talk about that in a second. Ah, okay. I won't show. I'll come back to that once I see it. Give me one second. I knew I would forget something. All right. All right, well, we'll see. We'll see something that's very similar to it. So... Um, the, uh, uh, there's, that's not how Macs boot, right? Uh, Ma Apple decided to, with the Intel Macs, to use EFI booting, right? Which is kind of the up and coming standard that Intel put out. And the disk, in order to be, for, use EFI, you have to have a GUID partition table, a GPT. And that doesn't have a master boot record, right? Because that's kind of the old style of it. It does have something that's called a, um, a guard boot record, right, at the beginning, or a guard uh, entry in the good partition table, and we'll talk about that. But now here's the problem, right? Windows 7, or Windows XP, it was XP at the time, back in the day, um, needed to have a master boot record to boot. And does everybody remember the contest? There was like a million dollar contest to get an Intel Mac to boot Windows, and then we were afraid about the point when people were trying to figure it out, Apple came out with Boot Camp. Anybody remember that? Raise your hand, remember that? Anybody win a million dollars? No, I didn't. But, um, and one of the kind of the key pieces is like how do you do that? And so um, one of the things, the way that Apple got it to boot is to be able to um, change what in a normal, master, in a ma nor normal Mac formatted disk for Intel, it has this protective Mac to ma master boot record, which is basically an empty master boot record with a unknown file system for the entire disk. Why would you do that? That sounds kind of crazy. If you have an old disk utility and you try to repartition the disk, it's going to look to that master boot record and say, oh, this disk you don't know about. It uses uh, EE, which is an unknown type. So the disk utility would basically say you got to update to know how to do this. So that's how, how it normally would be, and that's how it was up until the day that Apple released Bootcamp Assistant. What Apple decided to do was take that guard one that's an empty master boot record that was there just to protect it, kind of wiggle outside the lines of the spec and say, we're going to populate that with actual entries. 
So this is what the guard master boot director looks like. There's no bootstrap code. There's one partition that covers the entire disk. You have a one terabyte disk, it goes from zero to whatever. You could actually have 15 partitions on that disk, but according to this, it only says you have one partition and it's of unknown type. So uh, it's the Wikipedia entry. So that protective master boot record is there, and then you actually have the real partition table. So it was there just for old utilities. But Apple said, hey, you know what? Windows is looking for master boot record. It doesn't care if it's on this GPT. It just looks at that first sector and it just does its blinders on. So what Apple did is they populated it with the first four partitions. Um, Microsoft writes the bootstrap code. This is Microsoft code here. And it, it flags the Windows partition. Right? And these map to GUID partitions, but only for the first four. So if you have 10 partitions, you have to have Windows on one of your first four partitions. This isn't true anymore, by the way, but it's good to have kind of the history of it, right, to understand it. Because we're now in the Windows 8, Windows 10, newer Mac modes. But you have, how many people still dual boot old Macs, 2013 or earlier? All right, good. You're slowly dying off. <laughs> Not you personally, the computers. As we all, we were all kind of dying off, but anyways. Um, so then Windows 8 happened. And so for a long time, Windows did EFI boot. It was on the server. And it was because, and Motherboard started shipping with EFI booting like in 92, some, I don't know, uh, 2002, like way before. And what they did is they did it this emulation mode that made it look to a PC like it was master boot record. So the hardware people, it's like one of those circumstances where software wasn't ready, but the hardware was ready. And so what happens is Windows, Windows 7 kind of, sort of, EFI to booted, and you had to do a lot of tricks to it, and it wouldn't be all that stable. It didn't work very well on the Mac with the firmware. But in Windows 8, that's when Apple fully embraced EFI booting of Windows. It always booted um, the Mac EFI, but on, uh, on Windows, it wasn't until Windows 8. So uh, the new Macs drop legacy mode, right? And the way it's hard to tell which ones, well, it's not hard to tell. There's no direct way to tell which ones support legacy booting, which ones don't support legacy booting. But the document on Apple, when you look at Bootcamp, and if it supports only Windows 8 and later, that's a good indication that it's EFI only Windows booting, right? If it supports Windows 7 or later, then you know that it supports either just legacy or both. And so in our product Win clone, we actually have a before EFI P list that we have to twiddle to figure out what mode it is because it's really hard to introspect the computer to figure that out. Um, and it's the K-base that it's one of the things we have to deal with all the time is people say, I just migrated my wi Windows over my new Mac and it doesn't work. We go back and forth, back and forth. Turns out they're running XP, right? And the new Macs don't support that. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad you got the bits there, but VMware is there for you to download, right, to do that. Um, so some of the fun Macs uh, support both legacy and EFI. Have you ever seen on the hold the option key down, it says, sometimes it says EFI, sometimes it says Windows. And that's dependent on what model Mac you have and EFI, how it's viewing what expecting for Windows. So when people ask me, why does it show that? It's generally because the model and the mode that it's set to is not matched, but it might boot fine. So I tell people not to worry about it, which is not a very satisfying answer. So uh, in this brand new world, the new Macs only support Windows EFI booting. Uh, as we're seeing, I believe, new, I'm gonna change this maybe for next year, that new, new Macs only support Secure Boot, but we're not quite there yet, right? So as we'll see, Secure Boot uses or kind of daisy chains up to EFI and then takes it from there. But the, the nice thing is that the new Macs only support uh, EFI booting, which means it has to be Windows 8 or later. Pretty much we're in a Windows 10 world, especially with Microsoft's new model of 10 being the last version of Windows and they're just gonna inter, inter, uh, increment on it. So let's look at how EFI booting works. So we have the same power on self-test, turn it on, uh, you get the chime, and then it looks in the EFI partition. So the, the first partition, that's not true. There's an EFI partition, I learned this the hard way. There's an EFI partition on every GUID disk. And it's all, I've, I've always seen it as the first partition, but then I had some customers report to us that it was in like the third position. And I look in the spec and it doesn't have to be first, which irritated me because that means I had to fix it instead of somebody else's problem. But anyways, it looks in that first partition, it's a fat partition, and it's usually 200 megabytes. And what you have there is the bootloader. And that's, you can actually mount it on your Mac, I'll show you in a second, it's under the EFI partition, there's a folder called boot, and it's bootx64.efi. And you'll actually find this in a lot of windows, in every Windows install, it'll have these EFI files. This is the bootloader. So this is when it powers, power on self-test, it looks the EFI partition, it grabs this file and starts booting it. 
And it tell, it, in order to know what to boot, what disk to pass it off to, it references a BCD file. Bonus points for anybody who knows what BCD stands for? No? Anyone want to guess? Yes? N yes, exactly. No, boot configuration data. <laughs> but, but close. I like the reference to Berkeley. Um, and so this, this, is a li this is basically the uh, uh, config.sys or the, the file that used to say which disk to go to or even the flag in the partition. But what this has is it, it's a binary file that says what disk and partition do you want to boot to. And it does it by GUID, because GPT disks are GUID partition table, which means every partition gets a really long 128-bit, uh, 32-byte number associated with it. So you can uniquely identify it, which is kind of neat, right? Because that means that you move it from different machines, it would recognize the disk kind of independently. Um, but one of the interesting things about BCD is BCD is actually the same format as a registry file, right? It uses the same binary format of it, so Windows machines can kind of parse it and look at it. Um, but if you booting Windows and it doesn't even get to the Windows logo, you know that it, the BCD was never reached, right? So that's when you get kind of, when you do EFI and it just goes black, that's usually the case is your BCD is, is not there. And then at that point, so it knows what disk to go to and it knows what partition and then it looks for the boot manager and then it loads the boot manager and starts running. So that's very different from what we had the other one before. The other one was, was really dependent on code that was inside the disk that wasn't in a format, right? This one, the top one, EFI partition is a FAT32. You can mount it on your Mac, you can look at the file. Love it. It goes to a boot manager, it's on NTFS, it's a file inside the operating system. So you no longer have to write these weird bytes to the disk to get it to boot and flag things and use utilities. These are all files you can manipulate and deploy. All right, so let me show you. This one I can show you because it's actually on my Mac. I couldn't lose it unless I lost my Mac. Um, in 10.13, Apple uh, prevents you from looking at the, uh, the uh, raw disk with SIP, but I turned off SIP here, so don't tell anybody. Um, so if I do F disk, disk zero, so it'll show me the partition table. And you can see here, this is probably not the real partition table, right? Because I'm booted on this disk. It's type EE, which is unknown. Uh, cylinder heads and sectors. Remember back in the day when we used to have spinning disks and it depended on where the arm was? Um, those values are just kind of maxed out. And the real one is it was to start and it goes to the size, right? So it's basically saying this is a guard match boot record. If I were to run an old utility, it would just say, I don't know what to do with this disk. But so this is on a, a new Mac that's be able to, to boot it. So if we look at there's two key pieces. The sector size is 4096, and it, the size is this long number. So if I go to calculator, and I paste this in, and I multiply it by 4996, we'll generally get 5 and a lot of other numbers. And if you divide that out using uh, disk math, that's around 500 gigabytes, which is what my SSD is on this. And so that, that length of the partition table, so it's blocking it off. So that's basically mean it's like, this is a pure EFI. It's got this guard master boot record, or uh, it's got this guard one on there. But the real thing to see, if you do disk util list, you can actually see what's really going on. We have our EFI partition and then uh, a container. I haven't actually installed Windows on this yet. Let me go into, let me go into this one. Oh, let me talk about this setup first. I love this setup, right? Because I'm going to show you the boot selection screen on a projector up front which some people have said is impossible. But with lots of dongles and really expensive devices for game capturing, like people that stream on Twitch, you can do this. And so what I have is I, have a U I made it harder, so I used a USB-C Mac, which only has one port, right? Because who needs more than one port? I got my dongle that hooks up to this device called, it's the Elgato one that allows you to capture it. So I, that's this interface here. So I can actually do myself, like I'm a gamer. It's like, uh, Oh, yeah, man, I'm playing Fortnite. <laughs> I can stream directly to Twitch if I want to. But this device captures the output and just allows me to show it on my Mac. And then um, I have to have power on the Mac because I'm going to close the, lap, the lid. And in order to go into clamshell mode, you need three things, power, keyboard, and mouse. Right? So I close this, but I need a keyboard and mouse. I get this awesome little one here. But I, I need a USB port for it and I ran a USB port, so I have a USB hub here. <laughs> and I have to have Ethernet as well, because you don't want to boot. So I have an e a USB to Ethernet here. 
and it works. I really hope you said challenge accepted when you heard that it wasn't possible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it was possible. It was, it was flaky. Uh, but now it seems to work. If I don't breathe too heavily in it, it yeah. stays there. But um, so anyways, now I can actually, I was going to run Windows on this thing. So let me actually show you. Can you see that? Got really big. I should have streamed it live on Twitch. That would have been awesome. <laughs> okay. Saying, yeah, that'd be great. Xbox Live. Um, okay, so now you can see that this, this is kind of the more, has the EFI partition, which we talked about, which is typically on partition one. Then we have the APFS, which is like the normal stuff. And then we have the Windows partition. It's outside of the container for, H uh, for uh, APFS. And then there's the boot OS 10. Can I say X in that context? Boot OS X um, for the booter. So we don't care about that. We just care about Windows has now been moved to partition three, which is different because on, on 10, 12, it used to be partition four, which was fun, fun all around. Um, but it doesn't really matter. So now, um, what's the point of doing this? Oh, so now we can actually look at those files. I'm already told you there's those two files that uses to boot, and they're on the disk. So I do disk utility mount disk zero slice one. That's the EFI partition. And it mounts it. And there's the EFI partition. Oh, I can't zoom in. Ah, uh, how do I turn the zoom in on? Oh, it's accessibility. Ah, oh, right, okay, I keep seeing parental controls, okay. Uh, zoom, there, no. Scroll gesture with modifier, hey. Didn't they used to turn that on by default? I don't know, does that work, is that helpful? Okay, all right, so now I go to EFI, and now you can see on a disk that has not been formatted, Windows and, and Bootcamp Assistant is not installed, or Windows has installed, there's just Apple. And Apple doesn't use this to boot, it just uses it to boot to uh, extensions, and I think firmware updates are cached there. And they're also signed, so it doesn't, e the EFI is really not all that important to Apple, um, from my understanding. Um, and there's the boot folder, and in here you can see there's the bootx64.efi. So again, when, when, the, when you do power on self-test, it, it, it says, oh, I'm in EFI mode, I'm gonna mount this, uh, or look in this first partition, and I'm gonna start executing this file. And then once that, that, that uh, comes up, you see that in here, there is a BCD file. And in that BCD file, if you remember from what we talked about before, it has two things. What does it have? Anybody? It's after lunch. I want to make sure you stay awake, so I'm going to ask questions. <laughs> yep, it's the GUID of the disk and the partition, so it has to know. Now the Mac is relatively, relatively simple because it's always going to be most likely partition four, but it still needs to do that for Windows to do it. So it bounces off of that, and then it finally it goes to the actual Windows install, and then in here, uh, it's a hidden file, it's the boot manager file, is on NTFS. But you usually don't have to worry about that because Windows has that, and it'll run from there. But the nice thing about it is it doesn't have to have that volume boot record, which is like this bytes written directly to the disk. These are just files on the disk. It's really nice. So any questions on that? I get to throw this at you if you have questions. It's a win for me. All right, I'll throw it at you later. Okay, then it gets weird, right? And this is one of the things that's like running your head into a brick wall. So stay with me while we do this. So prior to 10.13, when you created, you went into disk utility or in disk utility on the command line and you created a bootcamp partition, right? Even if you use bootcamp assistant to do it, you created a bootcamp, you created a fat partition. If you created a HFS plus, it didn't do anything different. But if you created it XFAT or FAT32, it created a hybrid master boot record, right? That's the one that I talked about that had the actual entries with the flags and all that stuff. Then when a Apple was shipping Macs around the 1013 timeframe, it only supported Windows EFI booting. And if it saw that it had a hybrid master boot record and it tried to EFI boot, it would fail. So app on one side, Apple is creating partitions that would create a hybrid master boot record at the same time you install um, 
you install, uh, 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 you create a partition, it wouldn't boot from it. Boot Camp Assistant handled that, right? But this is right around the same time that SIP came about, which is the last thing, SIP, SIP prevented you from changing it. So it was like it was doing all this stuff just to hurt you, right? If it didn't do anything, like if it left it like it was, if you created an HFS plus partition, it doesn't create a master boot record, a hybrid mesh boot record. So I like would, every year I'd go in and I'm like, okay, I'm finally gonna report this to Apple. And I'd look back at like six other bugs that was in there. And they always came back not to be fixed because I don't know, I shouldn't be doing it this way or they didn't wanna change it or it worked well with Bootcamp Assistant. So then uh, early betas of 10.13, I got one of my bugs, my yearly bugs that I filed, they came back and said, try it now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's listening to me. Um, so now when you create a PAT32 partition, um, it doesn't uh, write, doesn't change the master boot record at all. It just leaves it alone. It stops, do the madness stops. And so then I waited for the GM date. And usually, you know, it's exciting on GM date. It was really exciting for that GM date for me because I no longer had to tell people to disable SIP to write, rewrite the master boot record because of something I didn't do. So Chicago, there was much rejoicing. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about secure boot a little bit. So that's our fourth way we can boot. And when I say secure boot, secure boot I mean of Windows because secure boot way it boots in Mac OS is different. And this is on the iMac Pro and I should say on the new MacBook Pro today. So this, there's no secure boot on things before that. And this is not secure boot without the space in the UFI spec. Apple does it differently, but it's very similar, kind of. <laughs> is that enough caveats for you? Um, so uh, the difference between what Apple does for secure, secure boot and what, um, what the way the Mac, uh, what way Microsoft does it on their devices or on, well, uh, PCs do it. Um, so there's two certificates that Microsoft will sign. So that, that file I showed you on the EFI partition, the boot x64.efi, that's digitally signed, right? And it, it's digitally signed by Microsoft. And they use two certificates to sign those bootloaders. One is the Microsoft Production CA 2011, and that's a Microsoft bootloader from Microsoft. And all these people, uh, like in the open source community, Linux, they're like, Microsoft's trying to stop us from booting on PC hardware. And Microsoft said, no, we're not evil anymore. We love everybody. We're going to sign your bootloaders as well. So they had a second certificate that di uh, Linux distros could apply for, like Debian, to get their, their bootloaders signed. But they used a second certificate called the UEFI CA for third-party bootloaders. Apple only uh, will check the signature on the boot x64.efi with that first certificate. And uh, the correspondence I had with one of the engineers was kind of like, we could add more if we wanted to. It's, it's there, but a file a radar, basically. So this is enough to boot all versions of Windows, which is really kind of the key piece that Apple wants to do. So let's look at how it, how it works. So you turn the computer on, and it goes to iBridge. So iBridge is like a little version of iOS running inside your Mac, right? It's an ARM processor that's this coprocessor, and it has a secure enclave that it gets the certificates from to verify the bootloader certificates. See the asterisk? I have no idea if this is true. This seems reasonable to me, <laughs> right? We can't change it. Doesn't really matter if we understand it, but that's the general understanding of how it boots is, is good. But it does do a signature verification on the bootloader. Um, and then at that point, uh, or it looks at the bootloader, verifies it. And then at that point, it can continue on. And it, all it does is it hands it off and says, okay, EFI boot, you go ahead and do whatever you did before. So then it follows that other process we did. So that's only if you turn on secure boot. And that's how you go in the recovery partition and you turn on secure boot and you can turn it on. Um, so if you don't have that on, it just does EFI boot. If you turn on secure boot, it does verify the certificate on the bootloader for Windows. Yes. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh boy, can we hand this back? I don't know. <laughs> um, since you're not in the boot process, you're not net connected. Are they caching the CA? And what happens when the CA expires? Right, so this is, yes, yeah, so let me remember, I did look into this. Um, the, um, there is two different settings, one that will allow it, if it's the, once you install it, the first time it checks, it won't check again. But it will check when it's network connected, I believe. And so that, no, it's, it's either, 
Oh, if it's signed by Microsoft, it's fine. And then there's also one where it'll check when on the first install and if it fails from there, but it won't stop it from booting. So if you are on an airplane and you boot into it, it won't fail to boot, right? So if, as long as the file hasn't changed, it'll continue to boot. So I don't believe has, Apple has the ability to expire that and prevent you from booting once you've installed it and it's already booting. But again, that's the guesses down here, right? That's not, it's not, it's not that I don't know, it's not documented anywhere to be able to do it. Does anybody know differently? Anybody in cornered anybody at Apple and poked them in the eye with the hot poker? Made them tell you? <laughs> All right, so Tim, you're probably saying, Tim, isn't there a cryptic command line command to show something encrypted related to see if there's a signature on this bootloader? Oh, why, yes, there is. <laughs> so, oh, let me, let me get this. Here it is. So if, if there's an open SSL command that allows you to look at the formats, because all, almost all digital certificates are in, uh, if they're binary format, they're in DER format, and you can uh, use ASN1 parse to get the, what it looks like. So what I'm basically doing is I want to look at the certificate inside the bootloader, because why not? That would be awesome, right, to see where the signature is. Because before it was like, oh, it's, it's, it's secure booted. What does that mean, right? So really what it's doing is looking at a file, seeing if certificate's there, is it actually signed? So let's actually see if we can see that piece. So I've already mounted, already mounted the EFI partition. And I'll go into the EFI partition. And we go into boot. And Ooh, so this is the boot x64 that I was talking about. So that's one that's digitally signed. So that's what the secure boot will look at. It doesn't really matter that this isn't a secure boot machine because they're all since, uh, I don't know, Windows 8, Windows 7, they've all been digitally signed, right? So we want to look at the certificate. And let's see if this is on a separate computer, so oh, I have to type it in. This is going to be fun. Give me one second. But trust me, it's worth it because who doesn't want to see a cryptic command run? I actually might have it on this machine. Let me see. I do. Okay, cool. Uh, there it is. Hold on. Volumes, EFI, EFI, boot. All right, now if I do that, that command, yes, and this is, I know, very cryptic, but... It does have some recognizable things in it, right? This is certificate-like things, right? Locality name, Richmond, organization name, CN, Microsoft, right? And then it has the uh, key identifiers. So you can see these are the certificates that's embedded within that bootloader, right? So that's for me, it's always been a big question. It's like, with Secure Boot, it says it's signing the bootloader. What does that mean? It sounds like it's magic, but all it's doing is looking at this one file and verifying the certificate on or verifying the signature on it. So now let's actually do what we came here to do, because we want to understand how Windows boots. We, these are the challenges, right? If you want to support secure boot, there's a big relief in this, right? What it's checking is the signature on the bootloader that we already had. So as long as we don't corrupt our bootloader, which is just this file, we're good, right? I always thought like, oh my gosh, if I change any files in the disk, it'll expire this, signature won't work and it won't boot. It's not that, it's just that bootloader. And as long as the bootloader isn't changed, but the only thing that can change it is like if you install Linux or you, a virus or something like that, right? So if you just make sure that file's there, you're good to go. Um, so let's look at that. We know Windows boots now. Let's look at the three different methods for um, installing Windows, right? This is kind of the history of, of Bootcamp Assistant. So the first way you did it, you opened up Bootcamp Assistant, it made you go find your flash drive you hadn't used in three months, and you grabbed the one that was really slow, and it made installing Windows really painful. And you plugged it into your Mac, you're running Bootcamp Assistant, and it had you select an ISO of Windows XP, I think back in, the, back in the day, and it would copy all the files from that DVD ISO over to the flash drive, and then it would boot to the drive, and then it would, uh, it would create a partition, boot to the flash drive, and then install Windows. People remember that? that fun days back in the day? And that's older Macs only. We no longer have to do that. The remove partition was really kind of a cool idea, and this is really where the ability to do WinPE came about. So 
Um, and you're like, well, how is that possible? But it kind of added the technology into it. So what, when Bootcamp Assistant did, it would create the partition, but then it would create this extra partition, and it would um, uh, copy all the files to that other partition. And then you would boot to that partition, and then the next time you go into Mac OS, it would delete that partition, right? Which is a little bit scary. So if you've ever used Bootcamp Assistant and you install Windows, n watch the next time you go into Mac OS, because it will pause for like an extra minute. And it's deleting that, it, does, it runs the FSCK or check disk on APFS, and then it deletes the partition. And that can take a little bit, little bit of time, but it's because it's deleting that partition. Um, and the, the thing is, it doesn't use the regular EFI booting, it does, it dr boots directly to the boot manager, like it's booting from a DVD. And then it, it deletes the partition. And so what, um, the third way to do it, and that's what I'm gonna show a demo of this today, is that you can um, not do the deleted partition, because the problem that you have to delete the partition is if you boot from a partition, you can't erase the files that are on it, right? It's kind of like kicking out the stool from underneath you, right? You booted from those files, if you try and delete them, they're in use. But Microsoft has this ability to load the OS into memory, and you can actually delete the files underneath it and write over it. And so um, this is the way um, Windows Pixie boots and is able to boot into memory and then write onto the disk, right? It doesn't need to have any disk space to be able to do it. And Macs used to do that. It was diskless net booting, right? The similar, similar kind of uh, uh, philosophy. Um, so WIM itself, a WIM, as I like to think of it, is like a zip file, but a smart zip file. A zip file can have the same file multiple times, but it'll increase the size. A WIM can separ separate those. It still compresses it, keeps the directory structure, but if there's files in multiple locations, it'll just reference those, right? It, it won't make it larger. And so if anybody ever gotten a DVD or ISO, or ISO from Microsoft that has multiple editions of Windows on it, it's kind of common these days. If it's education, education N, uh, enterprise, enterprise N, retail, I mean, they're all be on the same one. And it's not that much bigger. It's not like it's 50 gigs, right? It's still six gigs. It's because it used the WIM format to, to reference all those same files. Because the difference between education version of Windows and enterprise is not that, it's not gigs of files, right? It's a, a small amount of changes. And there's two WIMs that we use. So if you open up a Microsoft uh, ISO, you'll see that there's a base, uh, there's a install.wim, right, which has all of the, uh, all of the vanilla versions of Windows, right? This has all, it's like the base OS. And then there's a bootable WIM called boot.wim. And that's kind of to bring you into this WinPE environment. So let's look at a WIM. So I have here, PSU, I've got a, I love the file names they do, SW DVD 9 Win Pro 10 1709 64-bit English Pro Enterprise Education I, ISO. And one of the beautiful things is you can double click on it and it'll mount it. And you notice it doesn't have like 16 different versions of Windows, it just has one, right? It just files on a DVD. If I look in sources, you can see there's a boot.wim, and that's the, the environment that it boots up into, but it also has an install.wim. And look at the size of this sucker. Right? That's the majority of what you're downloading. This is the base install of Windows. And that isn't just Windows, that's multiple versions of Windows. So if I look at it, there's a command line utility called um, wimlib, and if you do a dir on it, see if that works. Ah. I wasn't that lucky, let me see. I'm gonna have to drag here. Oh, right, uh, sorry. I have to do an info on it first. There we go. I'll explain this in a second, give me a second. There we go, okay, so the utility is wim info, is the command line utility. It's basically saying what what things are inside this one, because there could be multiple indexes. And the install.wim, if I run this, you can see you go up to the top, it, this is Windows 10 Education at index one. And then it has Windows 10 Education N, which I think means it doesn't have the store stuff in it. Is that right? Anybody familiar with that? What's that? Oh, okay, Internet Explorer. Oh, for Air Europeans, okay, fair enough. Uh, Windows 10 Enterprise, Windows Enterprise, Enterprise N, Windows 10 Pro, Windows 10 Pro N. So those six versions of Windows are all inside this WIM. So when you restore those files, it can be any of these different versions. And so there's another, there's a similar command called WIM DIR, 
which you specify which whim you want. So I'll do the first one, and then you can see that this is all, here's the recycle bin. It basically lists the files out from there. So this whim file is kind of cool, right? It means it has all the files you need as a base image. If there's only some way we can get this onto the Mac bootcamp partition, um, when we deploy it, we no longer have to install it, install the applications and capture it. We can just install the base and then put stuff on top of it. We want to layer it, which is really how PC admins do it, right? They'll import, so this is 1709, 1803 just dropped. When 1803 didn't drop, they're like, oh my god, I spent a month trying to do this new image. They just drop it in, rebuild the image, right, automatically, and then deploy that out. Or if they want a different version, Enterprise N versus uh, Enterprise, they just choose a different index, right? It's a lot easier. So that's how we explore a WIM. So any uh, questions on that? On the WIM files? Hand him the cube. <laughs> Used to, uh, in the olden days, you could boot a WinPE disk on a Mac yep. and retain keyboard and mouse functionality, but nowadays that has like disappeared because I guess USB 3 drivers or something. So in the boot process, where does those keyboard drivers take place and like how can you like restore that if possible? Right. We're going to get to that. Um, it's injecting a driver. And that is a big problem on the, the USB, uh, the C ones, because it's USB 3, but you can inject drivers. And it turns out that a new model, because Apple provide the drivers, and we can inject those in on first boot for WinPE and first boot. I'm going to show you how to do that. And so that was, a, that was another big, using WIM and injecting drivers has been a big relief for us to be able to do that because we have a route forward with a driver doesn't work. And it opens up a lot of other things like, Apple doesn't provide, when you go into the setup, network. The network drivers aren't loaded. But let's say you do want to have that. You can inject the network driver and have Ethernet work or Wi-Fi if you want to. It opens up a bunch. Once it's not just for keyboard and mouse. You can do other interesting things, right? You could potentially inject sound if you wanted to, so the sound would work. If you ever had a, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but maybe resolution on the screen because your monitor wouldn't support it. Um, so the BCD file is, again, I said it was a registry format. Uh, it det determines which boot uh, disk and partition, and also provides some other options. And so this is allows WinPE booting, which is the allows to boot into memory. It's an option in the BCD. Um, and where the BCD is located, uh, we already kind of went through. I showed you the BCD file on EFI. That's located on legacy. It's actually on the Windows um, uh, partition on the C drive. On EFI, it's the EFI Microsoft boot BCD. And then if you have like an install DVD, it'll be actually in a boot folder at the root level. So depending on how you're booting it, the BCD will be in a different location. So let's look at what happens when Windows boots up. So we've installed Windows, now we're booting it up. So it booted from, I mean normally when Windows installs, it boots up from the uh, uh, boot.wim uh, file, right? And then it, down, it puts down that install.wim. Right? So now you have a vanilla version of Windows. It may put some other files into it. And then it has to configure it. So when it first starts up, it has to load up the out-of-box drivers. And this is goes right to the heart of your question. The wrong drivers for USB are there, right? So it won't do it. The worst one is the Apple 64 SSD, right? If that's not there and you transfer an image to one, which is this machine, it'll blue screen, right? Because it'll boot up. And uh, the pre-boot will be fine because it will recognize the drive because the EFI recognizes it, I assume. As soon as it gets to Windows, it doesn't have the driver. It just blue screens. It doesn't recognize the SSD anymore, right? If you don't recognize the, S the drive, you're kind of, you get the spinning wheel and psh, inaccessible device. If you get an inaccessible device, flip the bird to, to the uh, SSD uh, driver. But we can inject that. We got past that. I was so happy when I did that, when I figured that out. So, it loads the out-of-box drivers, and this is where you get in problems if it doesn't have those, because you can't go through the SEP assistant, or you, can't, you don't have it on first boot. And then it runs sysprep. And remember I said on the installer DVD, or the installer ISO, it has the windows.wim file, or the install.wim? That's already sysprep. That's in a pre-boot scenario. So that means all of the automation stuff can happen with it. So it runs, it references all the files, all of the settings in unattend.xml. And there's some other ones to it. I'm going to simplify it for this. 
and really just almost everything you need in the unintended XML. This is where you can tell it to create user accounts. You can have it bind to Active Directory. You can set the name of the computer. You can set the organization. You can do crazy stuff with it, too. I mean, it's like all the settings and every one of the panes that you have going through Windows, plus a lot more, is available in the unintended XML. So you can tweak those settings. And then there's uh, setupcomplete.cmd, which is a command that will run. And so you can, if you're like, Yes, but I know PowerShell, and I want to have my code run. You can have that done, too, as well. And so this is, this is why the WinPE stuff is so interesting to me, is because people spend decades developing their process for Windows images, right, to get the right ingestion of drivers, how to bind to Active Directory, how to add it to the right OU in Active Directory, how to, how to um, uh, name it correctly. And if we can tap into that and do boot camp the same way, you can use those same images that went to a Dell and put them onto your Mac, right? And be able to use those images. And you don't have to do that anymore. So this goes to your point, drivers that make you angry. The keyboard and <laughs> mouse um, Ethernet is one that's like, I plug it in. And it's funny, when I was first doing this, I had sometimes a, uh, it's not FireWire, what is the, not the mini display port. Th uh, yeah, Thunderbolt, right. The Thunderbolt connector, you have the USB Thunderbolt ones. They have the USB-C, they have the regular USB. Depending on what driver you had, some of those doggles would work, some wouldn't, right? Which is kind of like, it was random. But now it's because of the drivers that's included. Um, and the SSD, that's the one that makes me really angry. And the sound as well. I've had customers where um, everything works great, but sound doesn't work. And so those can make, make you angry as well. So let's talk about that. So there's two versions of drive. Well, there's two places where Windows uses drivers. One is the out-of-box drivers. That's at first boot. Right? What do you need? Usually you don't need very much. Right? You need the display, keyboard, and mouse. Sometimes you don't even need network. You don't need a lot of display. Right? You don't care if the resolution is horrible when you first set it up, but you just need the very core ones. The nice thing about Autobots drivers is they're all copied to the Windows install. So any anytime you put them in there, it makes the size of your initial boot larger, but all those drivers will be copied um, into the, the normal install. And for Boop Campus System, Apple used to make the drivers available on the website. Now, uh, now it's all through Bootcamp Assistant. So you go into Bootcamp Assistant, and you go to the Action menu, and you do Download Windows Support Software, and it'll only download the drivers for that model you're on, which means you can go and collect them. You can be the Johnny Appleseed of drivers, <laughs> right? And I have this. I have these, all these folders on my computer that have all the, uh, the, the drivers. And you can see the top one is WinPE driver dollar sign. Those are the first boot drivers. Those are out-of-the-box drivers. The ones in boot camp, that has the installers. You can extract those and use those later. So if you look in here, you can see it has only the ones that you kind of need. right? It has the, um, I don't know why you need Bluetooth, but it has the keyboard and mouse, the SSD. Um, oh, it has to have Bluetooth keyboard. Right? If you have a Bluetooth keyboard, you need that, right. Uh, I'm not sure why it has the, oh, no, that's Broadcom. Yeah, OK, that makes sense. So it just has Bluetooth for uh, keyboard, trackpad, SSD, and a graphics card, I guess. So inside the bootcamp ones, they'll have network and other things as well. So the thing is, you can combine these up and put them into the same image and then be able to, um, be able to deploy them out. And um, if you haven't seen Rob Roy's session from two days ago, was it? Yesterday. You know, yesterday. Wow, it feels like two days. He does a great job of showing how to be able to collect all these drivers up and iterate over kind of the sysprep product, pro the process, using VMware and snapshots, which is really, I'm excited to add that in. I haven't a chance to add that in yet, but I think it's going to be great. Um, so what happens if you say, oh, I want to have uh, keyboard and mouse, right? There's an example, keyboard and mouse. Normally, if you would just grab the ones from the, the, it'll have the basic ones. But let's say you have some other functionality. You want sound. I always like to add the Ethernet, right? So then I can have Ethernet when I do this pre-install stuff. The problem is you go in here and there are EXEs. You can't really see that. Trust me, it says EXE on there. But those EXEs are self, uh, what is it called? Um, self unarchiving zips. So if you use something like the unarchiver, I don't know if people are familiar with unarchiver. I'm a very big fan of unarchiver. You just drag it to the unarchiver. It'll create a folder with like a bunch of files, a huge number of files that you don't have to care about, but if you give them to Windows, it'll be like, drivers, and it'll work, do the right thing with them. So a bunch of INF, language localization, a bunch of stuff that's scary at first, but it, it's just win oh, what Windows needs. It can be an opaque blob. So let me show you how to extract some drivers. Go back to my PSU, and I put 
Um, here is the drivers for, these are the ones I downloaded, and I can make you watch me download it from Bootcamp Assistant. But you can see there's the WinPE drivers, and let's say I want to add in Ethernet. So if I go in here, and it's in Broadcom, and this folder, and this folder's not supposed to be there, because they weren't be, ignore that I did that. And you would get these bunch of these EXEs. And so I just want to open them up in the unarchiver. So I'll go to the un unarchiver, and I'll drag this to somewhere here. And it just created this folder. So now I have these drivers. And so a bunch of license files. It's got a catalog, an INF. doesn't really matter. If you point all the Windows tools to this to, inje to inject it, it'll do that. So now you have the... Um, so now you have the drivers. Where's the cube at? Bring the cube on front. It's not that I can't hear you, it just doesn't get on the video. <laughs> okay, so when you're pulling the uh, drivers out from Boot Camp Assistant, is it grabbing all available Apple drivers or that models? Just driver? that models. Okay. There's a lot of crossover between them and and when I show you how to inject drivers, if you point it to all of them, it'll, it won't repeat the ones that you've done, but it'll make your images bigger. So you can be as nuanced or as like, heavy-handed as you want. So you'd have to do this process for each type of model of, a of Mac that you want to be able to deploy this on. That's exactly correct. Because okay. if you have a new Mac, the first thing you do is extract the, you go to Bootcamp Assistant, download drivers, look and see what the differences are, or don't care and just put them back into it. What was the utility you called? The driver magic? Uh, Driver Magician, that's one. You could just put it in there, I'm sure it figures out like ones that are duplicates and we'll make a set of them. Oh, okay, so, well, I think my question is related. So if you want to create one boot whim for, I don't know, three years worth of Mac models, yep. you can dump all the drivers into that one WinPE dollar sign? Yes, yes, we'll get to that in a second. So okay. we're, so we, what we have is we have two pieces of the puzzle. One is the install.wim, which is like the base install. Then we have drivers that'll work with the Mac. So we got chocolate, we got peanut butter. We need to combine these flavors and to do it. So we'll get to that next. And this extracted exe, you just put the folder, the whole f the, the folder itself, not like this individual singular files, into the WinPE driver. Uh, oh, you mean? Yeah, well, this. You could do that, but what do you? Now we have to do something with that. We have to ingest it into the WIM. Okay. We and haven't done that yet. All right. We had a question back here. Okay, we'll show you how to do it. So there's there's the. Go ahead. Okay, we'll get there. We'll get there. It excites me too. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, right? This is like when keyboard and mouse didn't work, it was like, I'm done, right? I have no idea what to do next. But this allows you to do it. So the install process, it, it boots up with boot.wim. It restores the install.wim. That's what I just talked about. Then you have a reboot. It does all the setup through the unintend.xml. It reboots again. Then you get to the desktop. So let's talk about the injection of drivers. So there's, there's actually three different ways to, to inject drivers. The first one is DISM, and that only runs on Windows. Um, and you just basically take the WIM, and you mount it. So uh, it's almost like, imagine if you had a zip with fuse and you could mount a zip, right? It's the same kind of thing. It's, Slipstream. what's that? Slipstream, okay, is that what the process, of, I never understood, actually knew what that was. It was always this magic thing PC people did. So you can take this, DI use the DSM command, you say mount this WIM, and it just mounts it, and then you can run another command on it, say inject drivers, and you point it to a folder of drivers, and it'll push them all into that WIM. And then you say unmount and commit. And at that point, your WIM now contains all those drivers. Okay, so that's the first way to do it. Second way is Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. And this is the way a lot of the, um, this is a very common way that PC users put or PC admins will put drivers together is they'll take their in Microsoft Deployment Toolkit or SCCM will have a similar functionality that allows them to point to uh, an OS and they'll the, the, the install that WIM. They'll also point to the drivers and then say update share or deployment share and it'll put all the chocolate and peanut butter together for you. Oh, and the third way is if you uh, after you install Windows, you can run that. Uh, run a script that install the bootcamp drivers, right? So that's because Apple provides an MSI or a way to extract the MSI where you can run that if you want to do that as well. And I'll show that in a second. Oh, 
Wow, that didn't work out very well. Just give me one second. I meant this is one thing I meant to do last night, and I didn't. Was increase the size of this text. There we go. <laughs> All right, sorry. This is a little caveman uh, editing here. Okay. I was going to do this demo, and I said against it because you have to boot up a VM, and it's really just three commands, and they take a long time. So the, I wrote an entire blog post up about this. Is, uh, if you, I'll put this in our resources, but you basically make a directory, you mount the WIM using DISM, you add the drivers, and there's a recurse flag, and you see where the drivers are, and then you unmount it. And that's how you inject drivers into a WIM. The only tricky part is you have to have a Windows 10 machine. I have a VM that I just spawn up, run the three commands. When you mount it, it takes a long time, especially if it's at like a five gig one. It might take two minutes to do it. But um, then you can just point it to that folder. So that goes back to your question of like the Broadcom one, then yes, you would move it to the WinPE one and inject uh, and point it to that folder and bring them all in. Or what I like to do is just throw them into a drawer and point it at the drawer, right? The junk drawer and just say they're all in one bucket and it sorts them out. And it'll look and make sure there's no duplicates. And then you'll have this whim, the same whim you had before, but now it'll be a magic whim because it has all your drivers in it. And when you restore that down, it'll, it'll boot. It'll have keyboard and mouse. All right, let me show you the other way to go about it. So I've connected up. I've got a Mac Mini here running a VM with Windows Server 2016. And so this is uh, Microsoft's deployment workbench. And I have this deployment share. Can you, can you see that good enough? Hopefully. Um, so I have operating systems in here. I just, all I did was I went to operating systems, import operating system. And guess what I pointed it to? Install.wim, right? And what happened when I did that? It found six versions of Windows in there because that WIM contains six versions of Windows. Then I went to out-of-box drivers, and this was blank. Right? And I went in and I said, import drivers. And guess what it does? It says, what directory did you, what junk drawer did you throw all these drivers in? If I point it to the bootcamp drivers with all the EXEs, it wouldn't find any. But if I extracted them with the unarchiver, it finds them, which is another magical moment, right? I'm not going to do that because, again, it takes a while to do that. But trust me, it works very well. And then after you do that, you go to the deployment share and you say, uh, oh no, sorry, here, you say update deployment share. Okay, and what that does is, all it is is an SMB mount. So when Windows, and we'll talk about this in a second, when Windows Pixie boots, it just mounts an SMB share and it has all these resources. And all these resources are the operating system WIM, the drivers, right? It has all the, all the pieces it needs, scripts to do it, applications to install. And this is kind of like the, the work group manager of is that where you do it? Yeah, the workroom manage, no, the uh, server admin of Windows deployment. Um, so I've got this deployment share. Let me, let me, get, let me follow the slides. This will actually be, make more sense that way. Let's get that. All right, so I already talked about that a little bit. So the way that works, a PC shop would do it. They would pixie boot the map and uh, Mac, or pixie boot the machine and it would come up and it would go to this deployment share and run a task sequence, which tells it to install the operating system and do all the drivers. I already showed a little bit of, um, uh, of that, but this is when you get into this uh, WinPE environment, it'll basically get to this environment, it's very common, you just run the sequences and those are all defined on the Microsoft deployment workbench. Um, it'll say, you can see all the different steps here. You can do pre-install stuff, you can format the drive, which we turn off. We can have it inject drivers, basically all this stuff. This is stuff you probably don't need to do. This is, again, the decade of when your PC friends have this tweaked out. And what you need to do is inject the drivers for Apple, and then you can use those same images. So they would normally have these text sequences um, that would work on a Dell or an HP, but you can also have it work on a Mac if you have it set up correctly. So for when PE booting on the Mac, it's different. You can't use Pixie Boot. Netboot is going to be dead, or it is dead. How many people think Netbooting is dead? How many people use Netbooting still? 
Okay, it's not dead yet. Um, so we don't really need to try and net boot this. So let's, we use a different technique, which is, um, well, the hard way is to use a thumb drive. So that does work. You can take an ISO for WinPE, like a PC uses, put it on a thumb drive, plug it into your Mac, and it will boot from there and be able to be in this WinPE environment. That's what people have been doing for a while, and it requires uh, new shoes and a lot of thumb drives because you've got to walk around and do it. Um, you can, I just learned this last week, is that I after it's done booting up, you can actually pull the thumb drive out and go to the next one while it installs. It won't freak out. So you don't actually need a lot of thumb drives, just a lot of patience. Um, and so this is the way we're doing, this is the way exciting for me, is that we found out that we can create a partition, boot into memory, and then in a WinPE environment, and then be able to install and run task sequences. And it'll install on the same partition it booted from. So if you think about that, it's kind of a cool thing. You, have, you deploy a package that creates a bootcamp partition. It installs WinPE on it, boots up into WinPE, writes Windows on top of it, runs the drivers, runs the applications, boots up, does its all its rebooting, and then it's finalized, right? There's no, you can actually automate the entire thing. Or just go to the machine and make it really easy when you go there, or screen share. So this is what, what, what's stopping you from doing this right now. One is that your existing PC images do not have uh, bootcamp drivers, right? That problem's solvable, right? I just showed you. You download the bootcamp drivers for that one, for the, that model. You extract the ones that you want, and then you provide that to the person that does the images and say, hey, you know how we said we got new HPs, you injected drivers? Here's some Apple ones. Just put those in there, too, and let's see what happens. Um, Pixie Boot's not supported. We can do that with a custom BCD and boot uh, WinPE directly from bootcamp partition. So let me actually go through this. Um, did I put any right? Here it is. So this is this is actually one of the fun. So I said before, a deployment share is just an SMB share. So if I go to the I IP address of, of this machine is, uh, the, oh, it's hard to read. SM, it's uh, 192.168.050. So I can actually connect up to the deployment share. There we go. And I didn't, I didn't give it the share name on purpose because you can see these are, I'm logging in as an administrator. So you can see it's the normal stuff, sysfall, net login, but I also have a deployment share. And this should look very familiar. So it has stuff like um, out-of-box drivers, operating systems. Those are the same things you saw in the workbench we had before. So basically, that's just a GUI front end for managing files on a share. So you want to add a script and configure it, it'll push it off to that share. And the magic happens inside this boot folder. Because when I did, remember I said update deployment share? It creates an ISO and a WIM file. And these are the files that we need to boot in bootcamp. So let me show you how to do that. And to do that, I have to switch to here. I haven't, I haven't found a way to hide that interface, but it makes me feel like a gamer, so I guess I'll leave it. So let me connect to the deployment share. Please don't do that to me. No, it should be. I have to be in the wired. This is my little USB thing. Oh, the button's not pressed. My USB hub's button wasn't pressed. <laughs> there it goes. Look at that. All right, there it is, deployment share. And now I go into boot. And we need something to be able to take, oh, let me zoom it in, sorry. We want to convert this WIM file. This is the light touch PE WIM. This is what you would make a thumb drive out of, right? If you mount this ISO, this will have, all, the WIM has all the vanilla stuff for Windows, right, to install. But the ISO has all the stuff to boot into the WinPE environment 
And inside of sources, guess what it has? An install that whim. Uh, no. Boot. Install that whim. No. DVD. Ah. That is weird. Anyways, I think my deployment screw should have screwed up. But anyways, it should have that in there. Well yes. Okay, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Now better? It's just, okay, sorry. Yeah, All right. So, so what we did, and I know this, this uh, there's no easy way to do it, because we have to set up the BDC, BCD correctly, we have to create the bootcamp partition, and we also need to import the WIM. So this is where, this isn't a vendor session, but I wrote this tool, and it allows us to do it, and I'm very excited about it. There's a function in WinClone Pro with create WinClone image from WinPE folder. So I just do that, and I select that DVD folder, and I import all those files. And now I have a WinClone image that I can deploy. And how do you deploy a WinClone image easy? You make a package. So I just say create package and I select that image. And this is the one I did before. And now I can deploy this package, it'll create a bootcamp partition, put WinPE on it, and then allow me to run task sequences. Let me get it started and answer some questions. So here's the package that I created, these same files. And what it's going to do is create the bootcamp partition. I'm actually doing an existing one, so it's faster to demo. We're storing the WinPE files. And it's fast, right, because it's, it's only like a half a gig, because it's only doing this pre-install pre environment and all the drivers. It's done. And now this is where I'm going to try to restart it. Here, clamshell it, hold the Alt key on the alternate keyboard so that it will show up here. I did this 15 times last night to make sure it works. Please let it work. <laughs> Stupid computers. Let me try one more time. Oh no, I know what to do, I know what to do. Okay, so if I do Mac, I put it in clamshell. All right, now I somehow have to go to the restart. Oh, this has a little trackpad on it. I love this little keyboard. Okay, go to restart. Hold the Alt key down. You can see that, right? Okay. This has never been done before. You show the boot on a projector, show the boot volumes in EFI. Have you ever seen this before? No. It impresses me. I don't know it impresses you, but. It actually has to work to be impressed, I imagine. <laughs> it's tight, but it'll work. It'll work? I just need to breathe. In blue, out pink. It worked in my room. Is it going to chime still? Does What's that? It did Apple chime. All right, well, the other thing is I can turn the laptop around, but that's really less fun. Okay, I'll do it that way. Did you provide your sacrifice to the demo gods this morning? I did not. There's I your problem. I'm a bad boy. All right. Yes, let's blame Penn State's mm -hmm. setup here, because the only thing that's different. No, yeah. I'm sure it's not that. <laughs> All right, so let me just select Windows. I'm sorry, I can't believe I have to do this. I'll turn it around, and you can see that it's booting in WinPE. Um, it does the progress bar, and then it should actually boot up.
So at this point, it's going to start booting into Windows. This is where the out-of-box drivers are really important. So we got the Windows logo. That's good. It doesn't. It doesn't unless it's in clamshell mode. It, it'll show it if it's in clamshell mode. All right. And I did a custom bump file with our stuff on it because why not? And at this point, it connects up to the deployment share and starts running all the... Um, uh, It'll, it'll give you the option to run the task sequences. And then I can just hit spacebar to select it. It'll show me all my workflows here. If I hit spacebar, alt N for next, and next, and there it goes. Now it's imaging WinPE, the workflow with all those drivers off the deployment share. And it's doing it on top of that going to fall down. So I'll let that run while I go back to this. I'll make a video and I'll post it up. How's that? Can't believe that didn't work. Damn it. All right. Um, so now we're at the last part, which is troubleshooting this. So there's um, the one of the big pieces that comes up is the uh, when things don't work, it's the model of the Mac plus the version of Windows plus the kind of the mode that you're in, right? So if those don't all match up, Windows won't boot. So if you have a new Mac and you're trying to boot Windows 7 in legacy mode, it won't work because new ones don't support legacy mode. That's why it doesn't support Windows 7. So those are one of the cool things you can try is switching between legacy and EFI to be able to, um, excuse me, be able to uh, resolve any of the issues. Uh, drivers, I wanted to mention SIP briefly. We talked about that uh, kind of obliquely, that uh, it, on 10.13 with new Macs, if you create a FAT32 partition, it won't mess with the master boot record, and you can install Windows on it, and it'll be fine. So you don't have to disable SIP. So that's what the most much rejoicing was, was that you have had to disable SIP before to be able to um, rewrite the master boot record. You don't have to do that anymore, as long as you're booting an EFI, which means it has to be a modern Mac, which is like 10.13 or later, right? So it's hopefully your machines. It has to be a version of Windows, which means Windows 8 or later, which is pretty good, right? You can do that now. And it has to be on 10.13. So a year ago, that was more problematic. Three years ago, it was really problematic. But now it's not a big deal, right? Because you have newer machines, uh, Windows 10, and uh, EFI booting. So any questions? Oh, no, no, we've this is an extremely important announcement. So. One of the things that I do a lot is uh, I've been learning a lot about WinPE or a lot about Microsoft de Deployment Workbench and uh, SCCM over last year. And some I put myself in as being like people they think they can ask questions about Microsoft's infrastructure, which I can seem to answer somewhat because I talk to a lot of people. But I'm not really the expert on this. I don't deploy Windows on a regular basis. I give the tools for people to deploy Windows. Um, so what I'm trying to do is it turns out there's a lot of folks like you that are doing this stuff and it would be nice to be able to share what you're doing as well as, as help out other folks to do it. And a lot of this stuff is really, I was actually told today, somebody said, uh, I don't post this stuff up because I figured everybody else knows it, but, you know, but me and I just figured it out, right? So there's a lot of things that we can share. And so what I want to do is not as my role of two canoes, which we have forums and support, but rather just a community around it. Because I know there's people that do anywhere from small to large deployments with dual boot. So what I've done is I set up kind of the infrastructure, and I'll be posting my stuff there. We have a Slack channel called Mac Dual Boot. I, I figured out that if I did Mac Dual Boot, I can get a UR, I can do, I get a DNS name. It's not on Slack, and it's not on Twitter, so I figured that's a good name for it. Um, and I set up some forums. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to harass you guys to do webinars once a quarter, right, about your uh, in, in enterprise environments or dual boot environments. So every time I talk to somebody that does this, they do it somewhat differently. Right? I learned a lot from Rob's session yesterday. I'm going to rope him on to do a webinar. There's some folks out at Cal Poly. There's, I know there's a bunch of folks that are doing dual boot that I think would be really interesting to be able to contribute to this. I think it would all be beneficial to it. So you think that's a good idea? Is that be interesting? OK. So I want people to go today. I'm not going to do this if nobody joins. So if you go to forums.macdualboot.com and create an account, it runs on uh, Discourse, which is kind of like Stack Overflow for communities, um, or join the Slack channel to let me know that you're interested. And I'll post the slides and stuff up there. And what I'm going to do in order to keep the conversation going, I'll be posting stuff on there as well as scheduling some webinars that are focused on what other people's environments are doing. So you're going to learn from that. 